The Peter Schiff Show. Well, it looks like that Jamie Dimon's bottom is turning out to be the trap door that I thought it was with the Dow Jones today down almost 190 points. Intraday lows, we were down over 200. The market was led lower by the financials. J.P. Morgan itself down better than 4%. Remember, it was Jamie Dimon having the confidence to put a year's salary uh, into company stock that sparked this rally. But it seems to me that it's losing steam and rolling over because we're not going to get a lasting uh, bottom until the Fed makes that bottom. It's not going to be a Jamie Dimon bottom. It's got to be a Janet Yellen bottom. And as much as I have no interest in seeing Janet Yellen's bottom, I think that's exactly what we're going to have to do to get a real low in this market. Remember, Every single decline that the market has experienced since 2009, the bottom has been set by the Fed, not by individual investors uh, you know, trying to pick it. But it's been the Federal Reserve forming that bottom by coming to the rescue with rate cuts, QE programs, Operation Twist, hinting about another QE program. And so far, the Fed has done none of that. The Fed is still sticking to its narrative that rate hikes are coming. Yes, nobody believes that they're coming anytime soon, but that is still the official forecast is that higher rates are coming. We don't know when, but they're coming. Meanwhile, the markets can't even deal with the rates where they are. And of course, if the Fed is still talking tightening, they can't ease. They can't rescue the market. And so the market is going to keep falling. Of course, the gold market is going to be the mirror image of the stock market. Gold was up about 16 bucks today, although it reversed a near $20 decline yesterday. Uh, so gold hasn't really gone anywhere in the last few trading sessions, but it's still closed at 1225. It is consolidating its huge move above 1200. In fact, we haven't traded below 1200 in New York market hours. We were there once in Asian trading, but when the New York markets were open, since gold has been above 1200, it has never traded below. And so there is a lot of buying up here. We are not getting the pullback that Dennis Gartman and Jim Cramer are hoping for to get on board. I think if people want to get on board this train, this is the stop. This is the station they got to load in on. If they're waiting for 1150 or 1100, it's probably going to be a long wait. And in fact, they're probably going to end up jumping on board at 1300 or higher uh, if they're uh, trying to wait for that big a pullback. I think if you like gold, you got to just buy it and be happy that you're getting it for 1225. Yes, could you have bought it below 1100 if you acted in December? Sure, but 1225 is still cheap. You know, it's still a good price. Don't get greedy and don't be fearful that uh, it's going to pull back after you buy because who cares? Because I think there's a lot more upside. And in fact, the most interesting aspect of the big drop in gold yesterday, remember, we were down about 20 bucks the entire day. The gold stocks didn't really decline. There was a bit of a sell off on the open and then a quick rally. And in fact, most of the gold stocks finished positive on the day. I have been seeing a $20 drop in the price of gold with gold stocks going up in a long time. And then gold stocks added to those gains today. The Most gold stocks are now sitting on their highest close of the year. In fact, there are several gold stocks that are at 52-week highs. And I tell you, the 52-week high list is pretty short. Other than gold stocks, I'm not even sure what stocks are on that list. Although the 50 a two week lower list. I mean, that's, you know, that's looking like a rap sheet uh, by a, of a gangster because you've got a lot of stocks that are making 52 week lows. And that is going to continue until we get some help from the Fed. Now, something happened on Friday that, of course, made some people believe that that help from the Fed is not forthcoming which may be part of the reason why the markets are now declining. And that was the release of the CPI number, which actually caught a lot of people by surprise because we got the number. And January consumer prices, even though they were unchanged, and of course they were actually forecast to drop by one-tenth of a percent. So that was a bit of a, of a beat, a little hotter than expected. But the real number was the core 
the core rate, which excludes food and energy, which is what the Fed likes to look at, right? Because they don't want to look at uh, the transitory prices of food and energy. So they're always talking about the core. Well, the core was up 0.3 month over month. That was the biggest jump in core consumer prices since August of 2011. So almost five years, five years. And year over year, which is another uh, metric that the Fed likes to look at, the increase in the core price year over year was 2.2%. That is the biggest increase in core consumer prices since June of 2012. Now, remember, the Fed says our target is 2%, right? Well, we got 2.2. We're there, right? We can raise rates. And that is what's so scary. But, you know, I wrote a commentary that's up on our website today, and you should read it. In addition to listening to what I have to say here today, go and read that commentary. It's the Fed's worst nightmare. And... I got that title after reading an article in which some ridiculous economist, he, he looked at the fact that the CPI was a 2.2, and he said this was a dream come true for the Fed. And this is how clueless this guy was. He was saying that the Fed really wants to raise rates, but there's a problem in that they're not at their inflation target. And that's been frustrating the Fed because they really want to raise rates, right? Because, you know, they want to show how, how strong the economy is. They want to get some distance between zero and wherever we're going to be. So in the future, if there's ever another recession, right, they've got all the dry powder. So the Fed is dying to raise rates. But that pesky inflation target, their mandate to have 2% inflation has been in the way because we haven't had it. Well, now this number solves the problem. What a relief for the Fed. Oh, my God, we got 2.2. Finally, finally, we've hit our goal. Now we can raise rates. This is what this idiot actually believes. See, first of all, the Fed doesn't have a mandate to have 2% inflation. The Fed made that up. The Fed's real mandate is price stability. And price stability isn't defined because everybody knows what the word stable means, right? It means not changing. It means prices that stay the same, right? The mandate is uh, stable prices. The Federal Reserve decided to interpret that mandate to mean an increase of 2%, which is like, you know, we just had a Supreme Court justice a pass away last week, Anton Scalia. And Scalia is one of the few justices that believed in the bizarre concept of original intent, which, you know, it's really like a crazy idea. And what his crazy idea was, was that the Constitution actually meant what the founding fathers thought it meant when they wrote it, right? That the words in the Constitution actually mean what they say. And if you want to know what the Constitution means, you should actually look to what the founders meant when they actually wrote it, right? The intent of the people who wrote the law, that should be controlling. Now, the fact that that's even controversial and considered like an extreme view is ridiculous. Of course, that's what it means. I mean, laws have to mean what the uh, author of the law intended. When the law was enacted, if you want to know what it means, you got to look at what they meant. That's what it means, right? In fact, you if you want to know what the founding fathers meant, and the Constitution... You know, again, my father always said it, it, it doesn't need to be interpreted because it's not written in Chinese. If you read the Constitution, it's pretty clear. But if you're not sure, go back and read the Federalist Papers, right? You can read what Hamilton said or uh, Madison or Jay. Uh, they wrote the Federalist Papers. This was articles they wrote that were published in New York. It was meant to explain the Constitution, what it meant so that people would support it. Go back and read the Federalist Papers. Read the elegant debates. These are the debates. They're, they're, you can read them. This is the Continental Congress debating on the meaning of the Constitution when they're passing certain things and changing the language. So you can see exactly what they meant you know, when they wrote the Constitution. That's what it means. But you've got these activist Supreme Court justices that ignore all that. And they say, well, the Constitution means whatever we want to think it means. It's a living, breathing document that changes with the time. So depending on what the political zeitgeist is, you know, whatever whatever the mood of the country is, that's what the Constitution means, which is complete and other nonsense, because that would mean we have no Constitution. That would mean we're a nation of men, not a nation of laws. You know, laws are not up to interpretation, right? There's a legal concept called void for vagueness. Laws need to be clear. That's and they're not up for interpretation, which I think is is interesting that all the laws that apply to people average citizens, they're not up for interpretation. We don't interpret the laws against uh, robbery or against rape or against murder, right? But so why are the laws that are meant to restrain the government, why are they up to interpretation? 
They're not. It's because the government wants to ignore those laws, and so it ignores them under the guise of interpretation. Well, the reason I bring this up is because that's what the Fed has done with the mandate. The original intent of that mandate of price stability was price stability, stable prices. The Fed has redefined that mission to 2% inflation every year. They don't want prices to remain stable. They want prices to rise 2% every year. But that's their choice. So to say that, well, they, they would love to raise interest rates, but they can't because they have this 2% inflation mandate. They don't have that mandate. They made that mandate up themselves. And they made it up because they don't want to raise interest rates. That's the last thing the Fed really wants to do. Yes, they did a quarter point reluctantly in December of last year, right? At 11th hour, their back was to the wall. They had been hinting all year and they didn't do it. And they finally slipped a little one in there. And they hoped, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't hurt, right? They hoped the pin wouldn't prick the bubble. And they bet wrong uh, because the air is already gushing out from that tiny little pin. But this is a self-imposed limit, right? So the Fed could raise interest rates anytime it wants. It can just declare, hey, we have stable prices. So I'm gonna, we're going to raise interest rates. But no, they want to say, oh, well, we can't do it, can't do it because we don't have our 2%. Well, now they've got it. They've got 2.2%. And the guy that wrote this article is like, okay, great. Now they can get on with the rate hikes. No, they can't. That's the last thing they're going to do is raise uh, rates. I said this in the beginning. The Fed initially erected these two goalposts for when they would raise rates. The first one was 6.5% unemployment. Yeah, yeah, we saw what happened to that. They didn't raise rates the first quarter point until we got to 5%. What happened to 6.5%? They moved the goalpost. That is exactly what I said. Go back and listen to my podcast from the first time Ben Bernanke actually said that if unemployment gets 6.5%, we're raising rates. What did I say? No, he won't. I said if we ever get there, he's moving that goalpost because the Fed can't raise rates. Otherwise, the unemployment rate will spike back up. Well, the other goalpost was inflation, right? Hey, if inflation gets to 2%, well, now we're going to raise rates. Well, it's there. They're not raising rates. They can't raise rates. The question is, when will the market figure this out? How far can they push that goalpost back. Can they go to 3%, 3.5%, 4%? What will the market tolerate? Because, see, that's the Fed's worst nightmare. It's not their dream come true. It's the fact that people figure out that when it comes to rate hikes, right, they're all hat and they're, they're no cattle. They can talk a big game. They can bark all they want, but there is no bite. Because if they raise interest rates to fight inflation, well, everything's going to collapse because if inflation does get too hot, if inflation gets up to 3%, they can't fight that by raising interest rates to a half a percent or three quarters. If inflation's three and you want to bring it down, you need interest rates of four. You got to get out in front. And, you know, here's what I think is very interesting. And I mentioned this too in, in that article. 2% inflation is supposed to be nirvana, right? It's great. It's the ideal. It's the holy grail of economics. But when we hit 4% inflation under Richard Nixon, that was considered so awful, so horrible, that we resorted to draconian legislation of mandatory wage and price controls because inflation was 4%. Now, how can there be such a small difference between economic nirvana and economic Armageddon, right? 2% is perfect. It's what we shoot for. But if it gets to 4%, oh my God, all hell's going to break loose. We need wage and price controls. Now, maybe the economists of today want to go back and say, hey, Richard Nixon, you know, he shouldn't have been upset at 4% inflation. It wasn't that bad. And when, when uh, Gerald Ford came in with those whip inflation now buttons, you know, hey, he, you know, there's no reason to whip, in, whip inflation. What we really need to whip is deflation. You know, I'm surprised the Fed hasn't introduced those. You know, maybe Janet Yellen can get some whip deflation now buttons out there and, you know, get us all excited about, you know, pounding that beast back into the ground. But these numbers are showing that we're already starting to see rising prices. And here's the thing. These are the government's own doctored up numbers. I mean, who knows how fast prices are really rising? I mean, they're down for gasoline. That we know. But food prices are up. Rent prices are up. We all know health insurance costs are way up thanks to Obamacare, but utilities are up. I mean, most prices are going up. That's why so many people are upset. That's one of the reasons that, you know, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are so popular, because people's real incomes are falling. Their wages are down. Their cost of living is up. This is what's going on. And if the Fed thinks, and this reporter, too, these reporters were acting as if 
this increase in inflation was good news. It's good for the economy. This is horrible news. The consumer is already barely staying afloat. How are higher prices going to ease his burden? They're not. They're going to make it worse. If you are struggling to get by now and your cost of living goes up, you're not going to celebrate that. That's not a reason to be excited. That just makes it worse for you. So this is just going to compound the problem. We're going from slow growth to stagflation. And in fact, I don't even think it's stagflation because stagflation means a stagnant economy. Well, a stagnant economy would probably be an improvement because our economy is not going to stagnate. It's going to contract. We're going to be in a recessionary or inflationary recession, right? Just not stagnation. And maybe it's going to be an inflationary depression. In fact, we may very well beat a depression. Uh, and we've been in one uh, since 2007, since late 2007. We never really got out of it. Yes, we've blown some bubbles inside of it that have made people think that we've had a recovery. But I've said all along that we haven't recovered from anything. We've gotten sicker and sicker thanks to the Fed. Now, let me get into some of the other economic data that has come out this week since we got the CPI on Friday. We did get the PMI manufacturing index, flash index, for February. Uh, January's number was 52.7. And the consensus was that we would end up with 52.5 for February. Instead, we got 51 even. So a rather substantial decline. We're getting closer and closer to 50. I think, in fact, if we don't get some help from the Fed within a few months, this number will be sub 50, uh, indicating uh, official contraction there. Also, we got the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index today, another negative number. Last month, January, we managed to get plus two. They were looking for another plus two. Instead, we got minus four. In fact, nobody was looking for anything anywhere near that bad. The whole range of forecast went from plus three to minus one. Instead, we got four times as bad as the worst possible forecast. And even consumer confidence numbers were down in February, although why consumers are still this confident is beyond me. Uh, but this is the lowest number we've been, I don't know, what, six, seven months or something like that. We, we were at 98.1 last month, and the consensus was for a slight decline to 97.2. Instead, they revised last month's down a bit to 97.8, but the February number came in all the way down at 92.2, again, blowing away the lower end of the consensus range, which did range from a low of 95 to a high of 100.5. Again, the actual number was 92.2. And again, I still think consumers are overconfident. And I think that number ultimately goes a lot lower. You know, ironically, and I mentioned this on an earlier podcast, one of the things that's going to help support consumer confidence is when consumers really start to appreciate how much prices are going to be rising. Because I mentioned this before, the, I, the thought that the cost of living is going to rise is interpreted by the confidence survey as being a positive, meaning that if a consumer believes that the cost of living is going to go up, that shows that he's confident in the economy. And so, you know, thinking that prices are going to go up leads Wall Street to believe that the consumers are therefore confident. But I don't think it means they're confident at all. I mean, if I'm a consumer and I think the cost of living is really going up, that's going to undermine my confidence. I'm going to be more worried if I think prices are going to go up than if I thought prices were going to go down. If I thought prices were going to go down, that would give me confidence. Oh, my cost of living is going to go down. Oh, good. That, that means I'm more confident. If I think my cost of living is going to go up, I'm less confident. But the confidence numbers have it upside down. Same thing with interest rates. You know, if people think interest rates are going way up. It's supposed to show how confident they are. Believe me, if I was a typical American with a bunch of debt, the last thing I would want to believe is that rates are going way up. I mean, if I had any reason to be confident thinking that rates were going to go way up, that would destroy it. I mean, what if I have an adjustable rate mortgage? You know, what if I got credit card bills that fluctuate? You know, I don't know. Some of these student loans, you know, they could get reset if there's higher interest rates. I mean, that would scare the hell out of me if I was a typical American with a bunch of debt. Yet according to... Uh, these confidence numbers, that would be reported as increased level of confidence. So right now, in fact, ironically, one of the reasons the confidence numbers were down is because people have lower inflation expectations. <laughs> so, so right now it's working 
uh, it, to depress the number, but eventually it's going to support the number. But I think when people really understand how much prices are going to go up, it's going to scare the hell out of them, yet somehow it's going to be interpreted by this survey as a lot of uh, confidence. And one final thing that I want to uh, mention, it's a bit of a sad day for me. It's uh, my father's birthday, or it was my father's birthday, February 23rd. He would have been 88 years old had he survived uh, to see to see this birthday. And, you know, many of you have purchased some of the books that my father wrote that I've been selling at Shift Books, and we still have some left. We sold out of all of the biggest cons. We sold out of all the Social Security swindles. I have 15 copies remaining. We just did an inventory of The Great Income Tax Hoax, which I think is a phenomenal book on the constitutional... Uh, you know, evolution of direct taxes in the United States, a real good history, and a lot of other stuff. It's probably the best book written on the history of the income tax. I actually helped my dad. And in fact, in the hardcover of that book, hard copies, which we don't have for sale, I only have a couple of copies myself and I'm not selling them. Uh, but I'm actually, a pi there's actually a picture of me with my dad in the back of the book and my name is on the cover. But when my dad reprinted the paperbacks, you know, I didn't make the cut. So my name was taken off and my photograph was taken off. And so those are the only ones we have to sell. But those are the original paperbacks that my, my dad printed years and years ago. They're not new ones that I printed, but they're unused. They're, they're, they're in, in boxes. Uh, and we've got 15 left. So, you know, you should, you should buy one of those before they're gone. In fact, I'm sure after I mention them again, they will all be gone. But it might be good on my dad's birthday if you want to pick up that book, The Great Income Tax Hoax. Now, one thing that I decided to do uh, uh, to honor my dad's birthday, I couldn't figure out something. I've never sold yet any copies of How Anyone Can Stop Paying Income Taxes. That was my father's first book. Came out, I think, 1981, the year I graduated high school, or 82, right now. And that was his actually official best-selling book in the bookstores. It actually made it to number nine on the New York Times bestseller list. And, you know, one of the reasons that I never even mentioned selling it is I didn't even have any of these books, but also um, everything that's really in this book is covered in the federal mafia, which by the way, we still have copies left of the federal mafia. That was my dad's most recent book. And I have the final edition, the third edition of the federal mafia. That is the book that was banned. And it was illegal for my father to sell that book. He was banned from selling it, but they never banned me. So I can sell it uh, until we run out of copies, but we still have some. Uh, and we still have a lot of copies of the Kingdom of Malts. I happen to have a bunch of those. We've sold thousands. I still have more. It's a great little book. Uh, and uh, so you can order that one as well. But How Anyone Can Stop Paying Income Taxes was the book that really, you know, got my dad going. I mean, he wrote The Biggest Con before that. But this one is, was really this bestseller. And, you know, he ended up getting into a big legal battle with Simon & Schuster, which was the original publisher of that book. And he ultimately republished it under his own company, Freedom Books. And that's when he started his own publishing company. Uh, because The Biggest Con had initially been published by Arlington House in hardcover. He came out with his own paperback version through, through uh, Freedom Books, which is where he published. Actually, no, I got that wrong. He started his pu publishing company before How Anyone Could Stop Paying in Texas. So the, um, Freedom Books published how anyone could stop paying income taxes, but he hired Simon and Schuster as a distributor. That's what happened. And then when he got into the legal battle with Simon and Schuster, uh, he ended up distributing the book himself. But when it hit the New York Times bestseller list and the original, it was a blue cover. It was distributed by Simon and Schuster. When he republished it, he did it with a yellow cover. And those are the ones that, that I have. And I have five boxes of books. It's a hundred books and that's it. And I don't even have them. I, a, a friend of my dad's has them and I'm going to get her to ship them to me and then I'm going to sell them. And that's all I got. And, and so if you want to get a copy of that book, it's probably almost all the information that's in that book is covered in the federal mafia. If you bought the federal mafia, but it's probably interesting just to have it as a piece of history, just to have a pristine copy of how anyone can stop paying income taxes. I'll autograph it like I've done on all the books. Again, if you buy this book, do not stop paying income taxes. Do not follow the advice that's in the book. That's not the purpose of my making it available. It's just so my father's writings are out there. Uh, so people have copies of his book just to remember him, to know that he was there, uh, to have to have something that, that Irwin Schiff wrote. 
Uh, ultimately, I believe my father will be vindicated uh, for his uh, understanding of the law, of the Constitution, and of the income tax. And I think these books will ultimately prove uh, that he was right. Uh, and it's nice to have them out there. So if you want to have one of your own copies autographed by me, how anyone can stop paying income taxes. And if it's not, i got to add it. i got to you know, add it to the uh, website, to the um, Schiff Radio website. So if you go there to buy it and it's not there, check back again. I guess it'll be up there soon. And again, the first people who order it, we don't have, you know, we have a decent amount, 100 copies, I think. Uh, but that's it. Um, and, you know, try to pick up one of those copies of The Great Income Tax Hoax. It's a fantastic book. And there are only 15 copies left. <music> There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks to truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.